Hi everyone, Anthony Fantano here, internet's busiest music nerd. And it's time for our first review of 2013 to 2014 Classics Week. Oh, did you say Classics? Oh my god, it's Cal Chuchesta. Anthony, if you're gonna be reviewing a super cool band like the Veb Nunground, you're going to need me with my super cool sunglasses. I couldn't possibly accept your cool guy sunglasses. But you are, right now. B bye Cal Chichester. Thanks for the glasses. I'll always wear them. During this review, The Velvet Underground is a beloved New York band featuring the singing and songwriting talents of the recently deceased Lou Reed. And I don't just want to focus on Lou though, because throughout the best parts of the band's career, they also featured songwriting credits, as well as the instrumental talents of multi-instrumentalists, Sterling Morrison, John Cale, and Maureen Tucker. There wasn't really a strong pecking order to the band's lineup, which did change over the course of the group's career to the point where the Velvet Underground's final album featured no original members on it whatsoever, Squeeze, an LP that I don't recommend you listen to. However, I think it is incredibly interesting that in such a short period of time from 1967 to 1970, with such turbulence going on in the band's lineup, in their style, in their sound, the Velvet Underground still managed to put out four full-length LPs that make up one of the most influential discographies in rock music ever. It's not often you see a band that puts out a record that is as experimental and as noisy and as freewheeling as White Light, White Heat, and then just two years later, they're dropping the very commercially sculpted as well as very enjoyable Loaded. Aside from their music, what made the Velvet Underground so great was their spontaneity, their ability to successfully accept and reject every convention music had to offer during their time with songs that were very poppy and lovely and gentle, beautiful on the ears, as well as tracks that were just vivid, gritty, disgusting displays of sex, violence, and drugs that would make most squeamish. And most importantly, what I think the Velvet Underground and this record represents is that great music doesn't need to be commercially successful as well as critically acclaimed upon initial release, because clearly this is an instance where we all got it later. However, let's not just analyze the band in a vacuum. For one, would we be praising albums like this today if it weren't for the commercial success of albums like Loaded, or the commercial success Lou Reed saw in his solo career? Would we be loving the Velvet Underground and seeing them as seminal and influential if Andy Warhol hadn't taken them under his wing? Are there other factors here I could be taking into account? Probably. All I'm saying is that while great music is great music, fame and acclaim are a bit of a perfect storm sometimes. Plus, it's not like the Velvet Underground was the only band experimenting to such an extreme degree within this time period of music. You had Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention, Captain Beefheart, the Sonics bringing the darker side of garage rock, the noisier side of garage rock to the table. Avant-garde music was in full swing. Psychedelic rock was in full swing. There's also a very general appreciation for the world of rock and roll on this LP too. Plus there were some other experimental rock and folk acts in New York in this time period as well, like the Gods, as well as the Fugs and the Holy Modal Rounders. Regardless of what influenced it though, the Velvet Underground and Nico is an incredibly bold record for its time and for today, and is also very deserving of its definitive and iconic status in rock music. It's filled with experimental, artful songs that range from being infectious to utterly strange and twisted, and the best tracks on here manage to do both at the same time. Even though this LP is the star of the Velvet Underground studio recording career, another thing does make this album special. It features a group of contributions from German actress, model, and singer Nico. Obviously, she's billed on the album's title. And even though she was pretty much just on this record because Andy Warhol wanted her to be on this record, she did have a number of very reputable solo albums after working with the Velvet Underground. And I recommend listening to them, especially if you enjoy the several tracks she sings on here. Like Femme Fatale, which is a very gentle ballad that's got a faint tambourine led backing beat mixed far into the left channel. There's all these very soft guitar arpeggios that feel sort of muddy floating around in the mix. There are these somewhat goofy backing vocals. 
Femme Fatale. And the way that the instrumentation on this track comes together is, is a little loose. It's not as apparent here as it is on other tracks from this LP, but know that when the Velvet Underground gets fast, gets loud, they also get kind of chaotic. But the spotlight on this track is really on Nico's voice. It's womanly, she has a very unique cadence to the way that she sings her words, most likely due to her accent. It's not a waifish voice. While it is very soft on the ears, it's very sturdy as well. Her singing on this song and the other tracks here is very pretty, but it's also offbeat in a sense as well. Even though she was sort of tagged onto the band by Warhol for this record, it is a really great pairing. Nico impresses as well on the very long, drony, and sort of one note, All Tomorrow's Parties. A track that has this very fast, repetitive, prepared piano phrase hammering away in the left channel, and Nico's very ghostly verses on this track trade places with these guitar leads that sort of jump up and down this key that the song is being played in. The playing of this guitar is sort of unrefined, it's kind of messy, it adds to the overall looseness of this track too, and the very heavy, stomping, bass, tambourine beat of the drum, which is very simple, it's very basic. It also adds to a certain characteristic of the track that makes it feel centuries old. The Velvet Underground's instrumental performance on this track is, is anything but composed. And I feel like the result of that intended messiness on this particular track is that the music feels like a, a bit of a clamor on this song. I feel like with this track I'm in the middle of some kind of festive gathering. People are dancing and talking and hanging around and enjoying one another's company. And the third track on here that Nico sings on, I'll Be Your Mirror, is a track that is another very simple, short ballad, not too unlike Femme Fatale, a song that's a little more stripped down, a little prettier, more accessible, and of a subject matter that I think is a lot more lovely, gentle, friendly. I do love these songs, but I feel like the Velvet Underground's iconic sound really came through on a lot of the other tracks on here, like the opener, Sunday Morning, with its very sticky Celeste melody that opens up the song. Boo, 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 boo. A melody that is not only gorgeous, but is also gorgeous. And the dreamy instrumentation behind it complements it perfectly. It's just an amazing song. Every single time I put this track out, I'm just like astonished at how pretty it is. Pretty and soft and gentle because of Lou Reed's very breathy vocals on this song. The reverb on his vocals too, that it doesn't seem like there's that much at the beginning of the track, but as the song progresses into certain parts, it increases. There's a very faint viola drone on this track too that just softens everything and just makes it feel very mm, zen. And then you've got some piano chords and some guitar leads that come in later on the track and give it a little bite. The song really kind of sounds like just the morning sun coming through the window and kissing your face. The leaves are green, the birds are chirping, there's a little bit of a breeze outside, the temperature's perfect. It's really what morning must be like for morning people. However, these very soft and gentle drones take a very sinister and dark, horrifying turn on my favorite track here, Venus and Furs. A song that lyrically is about a dominatrix type character. And a song that sonically is a lot like All Tomorrow's Parties in that it feels like this foreign, archaic gathering, but so much more sultry and sexy and subversive with these wailing viola lead melodies and these very brittle, dissonant guitars and on top of all of it, Lou Reed delivering his lyrics as if he's some kind of desperate submissive, just begging to be whipped as he sort of acts in the role of a character from a novella of the same title, which this song is based off of. Again, this song is drony, but it's also dicey, like another favorite for many on this LP, Heroin. Not my favorite track on this LP, but in a weird way, I think maybe the most beautiful song on this record because of how Frank and honest it is, as well as how interesting the free-flowing background instrumentation is behind Lou Reed's story and vocals. The song in a lot of moments is floating in this very slow, very just formless cloud of viola drones, some very light drumming, some slow guitar strumming. And lyrically, Lou Reed rambles and meanders and wanders through this heroin-fueled haze of his. But sort of unpredictably, the song just all of a sudden gains momentum, picks up speed. Mo Tucker is playing this drum beat that just gets more and more 
tension. And Lou Reed's verses on here range from blissful toward the beginning of the track where he is feeling like he's Jesus' son. And there are some moments here in the verses where <laughs> things get kind of dark and disturbing, where he is voluntarily and consciously nullifying his life. He's closing in on death and he doesn't really care about much of anything. I feel like this song specifically in the Velvet Underground's discography speaks toward the power of, of music and poetry and how they can put someone into a situation. I think this also happens on the song I'm Waiting for the Man, a very nasty, messy, noisy rock and roll song with a relentless, rickety drum beat. And the song is essentially about how Lou Reed is waiting for his uh, drug dealer. And in this song, he paints this guy as this weird, shadowy, elusive character, but it's also the situation surrounding this character that makes this song just so vivid. You can smell, you can taste, you can feel this song with the $26 in his hand. Lou Reed is going to a part of town where white people usually aren't and he's being questioned as a white guy like, what are you doing around here? And the very interestingly noisy rock tunes don't just stop there. There are others on here like the song There She Goes, which is a track essentially about a prostitute or prostitution. And a lot of people sort of stop their description there, but what I think is most interesting about the track is the point of view of the narrator of the song. Lou Reed essentially singing about this prostitute from the standpoint of someone who seems like they're really angry or pissed off or they really care about everything that she's doing, like they're somehow involved in her personal life, maybe in a romantic sense. And there's also the song Run Run Run, which to me is kind of like an electric Bob Dylan nightmare. And Dylan's influence, in my opinion, doesn't really just stop there on this record. It also bleeds into the Black Angel's death song, too. It's one of the many tracks that Velvet Underground, when playing this song live, would sort of stretch it out to very challenging lengths. And then there is the final song on here, European Sun, which is a track that is dedicated to a professor that Lou Reed had at Syracuse University. Not that it really has any bearings on what the song is or it's about. It has a few short lines of lyrics toward the front end of the song, and then from there it progresses into an incredibly noisy, dissonant, and challenging instrument. Not really my favorite of the Velvet Underground's more abrasive moments, but still, it does fit in with the general not-fitting-in vibe of this album. And in a nutshell, that is the Velvet Underground's debut full-length LP. Definitely a one-of-a-kind rock record, but still an album whose relevance and importance is heavily dependent upon everything that happened with the Velvet Underground and Lou Reed after it, which is not necessarily a bad thing, because when tracking the seedy underbelly of rock and roll, this is an important part of that evolution, a lot like the very first moment when the multicellular organisms living in the ocean first sprouted legs and crawled out of the water to walk on land. There is part of me that prefers just a little bit more of the very freewheeling sound of this band's sophomore LP and the very gentle and slightly more composed feel of their self-titled LP, their third LP. But still, when you're talking about the Velvet Underground's entire discography, you're just comparing one great LP to another great LP, I just would hate for a lot of you to listen to this album, like it, and not listen to their other work as well. Again, I would hate it. 50 years later, and we're still peeling slowly and seeing. Transition. If you've given this Velvet Underground LP a listen, what did you think about it? Love it? Hate it? And why did you feel either of those two things? Cool? Cool. Forever.